G'day. It's good to have you back with us. We're about to hear from Charles Martin. And Charles' biography is very interesting. And I'm going to cheekily summarise him as a very geeky musician. But he's also a respected academic working at ANU, the Australian National University here in in Australia. And he's going to tell us about his work combining music making and machine learning to build new tools for musicians. So as part of his talk, there is going to be audio and video from his slides, which is maybe a little bit louder than his voice. So if you've got headphones on, pay attention to when Charles is about to introduce that so you don't get surprised. Um, If there is time, we are going to take questions in the stream so just keep putting your questions into the venulous chat and our volunteers are going to pass them up to me and then i'll talk with charles about that charles take it away g'day folks thank you so much for the introduction uh, and thank you for having me here at the conference um my talk today is on creating intelligent instruments with machine learning uh so i am a musician i'm also a computer scientist and my focus within those two, two fields is in working in music technology and particularly in developing new kinds of musical instruments. So I guess for the last few years, something a lot of people have been thinking about in computer science is how we can use new tools that are emerging in machine learning and AI and apply them in, in lots of ways of everyday life that hopefully make people's lives better and not worse. Um, So, um, given my field is music technology, I'm trying to apply these things into music. Uh, And something I'm doing, which I think is a little bit unique, there's not too many people doing this, is to look at how to use machine learning for creating music, humans creating music with musical instruments, rather than doing something like music generation, where you're just creating a machine learning model, which is going to create endless music forever, and then you can do something with it. Um, people often say that they're going to put worry about putting composers out of business. Well, none of the composers I know make much money anyway, so maybe that's not such a concern, but at least we can try to do something interesting with music uh, and, and let people be more creative and, and create more music than they could before. So just a quick note, I'm, I'm speaking here in Ngunnawal country, also Nambri and Garigu country, um, otherwise known as Canberra in Australia. Um, that's the, the location of ANU and it's where I live. So the vision of my kind of program of research is that intelligent musical instruments should become a normal part of musical performance and production. So I guess you can go and buy a fridge that has AI in it. You can probably buy a motherboard that has AI for doing overclocking or something. You can definitely buy a phone that has AI in it. But you can't buy a piano that has AI or a violin or a guitar or any kind of musical instrument very easily that has AI to somehow help people. And I think I've, I've talked a bit about why I would do this, but get drilling down more detail, how am I going to help people with, with AI in music? I think we can find ways to maybe assist professional musicians and composers, not replace them, assist them, but also engage novice musicians and students. So music is something which is often hard, but there are often not just difficulties in terms of making sounds on an instrument, but practical social difficulties like getting together with your friends uh, to start a band or finding people to perform with um, that we can start to overcome. Also, I'm just interested in creating new kinds of music, music we've never heard before. uh, And I think that's a really interesting thing to pursue. So... What about what am I going to do with the machine learning and AI in this in these instruments? Well, I, th- I like to think of machine learning as a way of making predictions or musical predictions in a, a musical instrument. And music, the act of music performance is includes a lot of prediction. Musicians have to predict what other people in their group are doing. They predict what sound they're going to make when they strike their instrument in a certain way or do something. They predict what comes next in the piece of music they're playing. They predict what will sound good when they play it. Um, So maybe we can offload some of these predictions into a musical instrument or or somehow roll forward in time from where a musician is up to and use machine learning models to help us do that. I'm going to give a little bit of sort of machine learning background, not too much here. Maybe some of you folks out there have 
played around with AI and machine learning or, or read about it, and you've seen these machine learning models which can create text. So they might um, have as input a sentence of, of text and they'll predict the next word and then you can input that word into the model and predict the next word and so on and so on and so on and end up predicting a whole paragraph, a whole uh, script for a TV show, a whole book, you know, anything you want. Um, we can also do a similar thing with music. We can use a predictive machine learning model to predict one note at a time ahead uh, in a piece of music and generate music that way. So I call this note prediction. Um, and there's a very popular kind of machine learning algorithm for doing this called a recurrent neural network. It's a little bit sort of old news. Recurrent neural networks um, have been sort of on the way out in terms of the very big AI, big tech text models, but they're still very useful for music, particularly the models which I'm going to talk about today. And what do we do with these predictions? I'm going to talk about this in more detail with the examples, but um, there's a few things I think we can do. First of all, just let me break down how we think of musical instruments as computer musicians or music technology people. I think of musical instruments as a, an interface to making sounds. So there'd be some human on the left doing some kind of control gesture with any kind of buttons, knobs, bows, strings, keys, any kind of interface. Uh, and then there's some kind of computing process of creating sounds and then you get music out. So maybe our predictions can end, end up by creating more music. That would be the little dotted arrows on the right. Maybe our predictions can also turn into more control data so we could get some physical feedback or feedback through the controller in our musical instrument. And I'll be talking a bit more about that later. Um, and then within our musical instrument, we're going to have some kind of loop where it's, it's predicting further into the future and starting to spit out those predictions as we go and continually making these predictions as the, the user is interacting. So as I said, we'll get into more detail about how this stuff works when I show some examples. And most of this talk is about different kinds of experimental um, intelligent musical instruments that I've made or tried to make, as you'll, you'll find out in a minute. Um, one other technical thing is that musical data is kind of diverse. Um, when I showed you before these, these notes on the page, that's one kind of musical data, notes. It's a description of what key to play on a piano or what note to play on a violin. They're kind of instructions to musicians. You also know about audio data as in the bits on a CD or the, the bits in an MP3 file. So that's digital audio data, which is kind of a finalized, completed version of music once it's, it's actually complete. There's other kinds of data as well. We've got things like uh, MIDI data, which can describe in a more kind of low level way, the instructions of what sounds to make on a synthesizer. We also have just images or symbolic music that you would get in a musical score. And then also what I'm interested in in particular is gestural data or sensor data from the control gestures from the interface for music, musical expression, which are then turned into sound by the, the musical instrument. So I'll talk about how we predict control gestures in this talk as well. So here's my first example. And this one I, I, I like to talk about first because it's um, doing something which is very simple. It's running an RNN which just generates notes. It's a note generating RNN that just generates a melody and it just does so forever. And it was a, a project that a master student of mine did and I challenged him just to get one of these melody generating RNNs to fit on a Raspberry Pi and to fit in a box so you could take it around with you and just make some cool sounds. So it's got a couple of knobs on it. Uh, one of them switches data set that it has tr learned to create music. Uh, one of them switches instrument. One of them is a volume control. And then a couple of them change the parameters of the melody prediction. So it makes either more conservative predictions or more wild predict predictions or more creative predictions. So I'll just show you a quick video of how this works. This one is actually low volume, so you might hear it as being quiet. That's an old version that only had two knobs. I think he's changed it to be more creative now, and it makes wackier notes. So this is one kind of, of way of making a predictive musical instrument, but it's not that interactive, really. It's 
it's just a way of, of encapsulating one something that I consider to be not that useful to musicians or a melody uh, generator. What about things that are interactive? So this is something a little bit more interactive called the gesture RNA. Um, I've worked a lot with making music with iPads. Uh, you can see me in this video playing on an iPad. And the way I did this was with another simple RNN, except it was the idea was that it would listen to my performance on the lead iPad and then predict what the three other members of my virtual ensemble should do. And the data for this was a, uh, a series of quartet iPad performances that I'd, I'd done as part of my research. So I was performing with an iPad uh, ensemble and I just wanted to make sure that I, I would record all those performances so I'd saved them all, saved all the gestural data and classified the gestures into certain certain uh, types. There were nine types I had and then my RNN was actually working with the gesture classifications, not with the touches on the iPad screens themselves. So it could predict one of nine sort of states for each iPad to be in. There were things like swirling, tapping, tapping slowly, tapping quickly, um, tapping and swirling at the same time. And then during a performance with this RNN system, the iPads for themselves would look in a database and take out a bit of swirling and replay it on the screen so that we could all, um, the other iPads could replay those gestures and create the sound. So that was a way of using uh, a machine learning system to generate um, sort of multi-member ensemble performances. It was, it was a lot of fun to play with. The only problem was that I didn't train it um, ha with any sort of starts and ends of performances. So sometimes I would start playing and the other members of the ensemble wouldn't do anything. And in the within the data set, there are times when just one iPad's playing. So it had learned sometimes that if just one person's playing, that's fine, everyone else is silent. And then sometimes I would stop playing and it just thought that I was being silent and everyone else should play. So it was hard to do performances where you could start together and stop together. So that kind of aspect of musical performance wasn't encoded within the machine learning system. I'm going to talk about something else, another kind of um, simple system or a simple phone uh, tablet based system. This one was called RoboJam. So I'd, as part of some other research, I designed this app called MicroJam where you do little scribbles on the screen. Uh, and it plays through those scribbles to create a little piece of music. And I wanted to develop a machine learning system that would respond to one of these scribbles. So it would produce a kind of duet for you to play with. I guess we know these now, these happen all the time on TikTok, right? I should have done one to do with sea shanties, creating sea shanty duets automatically. But this was a weird computer music duet, which is not as meme worthy. Um, the way the neural network functioned was that it would um, listen to the whole performance through the control gesture data. And that gesture data was locations on the screen in X and Y locations and the time that each uh, little interaction would happen, a time delta from the last um, um, tap on the screen or slide on the screen. And then it would try to predict the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one by that same process. So it's predicting screen locations or finger locations on the screen, not exactly what sound it was going to make. Um, and this was my first experience with a, a different kind of neural network called a mixture density recurrent neural network, which I ended up using a lot because I thought that was a really uh, useful uh, mechanism for this kind of prediction. So I'll just show you an example of how RoboJam works in practice. And this, I think, is the first headphone warning. Oops. Yeah. I really like this video because um, I really like that because it shows that when I did some swirls, the machine learning system actually caught on and it kept swirling. There were enough swirls in the data set that it learned how to do that. And then after a while it decided, oh, I'm bored of swirling, time to do some taps. So 
the time delta got a bit longer but between each screen event and it started tapping so it was a, a little um difference in the sound uh, so that was the the RoboJam system this is a kind of image of the mixture density recurrent neural network i was using um, this is a bit technical sorry if this kind of stuff um, is is not your cup of tea but basically the idea is to take a neural network and treat the outputs as a mixture of Gaussian distributions or normal distributions or bell curves. So a, a mixture of um, means or averages and widths or standard deviations and then the height for each little curve. And this is a way of, of getting a neural network to predict a kind of complicated distribution that of continuous values and because each of the values the x location y location and time delta were continuous values not discrete then this was the kind of neural network which was useful for this task so i'm going to talk about another system which was a bit broader this was called imps or the interactive music prediction system and the idea with this system was that I would take my mixture density neural network that I'd already used in RoboJam and instead of embedding it deeply into an application, I would make it general so that any piece of musical software could talk to it and send it control gestures and receive predictions back. Um, so it's something which I've been experimenting for, with for quite a while now, about two years um, in different kinds of performances. So here is a, a sort of system diagram of what imps look like when it's being used and actually the the imps part of it is is on the right hand side of the screen it's a um a python application uh, which i just run in the terminal and it will sit there with this mixture density recurrent neural network waiting to get some information from a piece of musical software um, using a communications um, method called osc or open sound control um, which is sort of just messages over uh, UDP. Um, so it gets these OSC messages from an interface or any other kind of musical system, and then it makes a prediction about what it thinks should happen next, and it sends it back. Um, and I call it an opinionated net neural network for interacting with um, interfaces for musical expression. And it's opinionated because it has this uh, mixture density recurrent neural network which is dedicated to generating continuous data, not discrete data. Uh, the cool thing about imps was that it could work with any, with, I guess, um, musical interfaces of different complexities. So when I was talking about RoboJam, I had three dimensions I had to worry about. X, Y, up and, up and down on the screen, left and right on the screen, and dt the time delta between each interaction event on the screen obviously if you do a slide on the screen the interaction events are very close together in time about 1 60th of a second if you're on a standard phone um, and if you tap then they could be further apart in time depending on how slowly you tap so with imps it could change this dimension of this uh, neural network so that it would function with three dimensions x y and dt it could work with two dimensions just dt and just one x value maybe moving one fader up or down or one knob turning left and right or it could work with um, nine dimensions which was the case with this uh, music interface i've got in this picture where there were nine knobs and it was predicting all of them simultaneously um, so it was I, i've got on this slide it says weaponator for deep learning and this is kind of where the inspiration came for this system there's a, a great system called Weconator by a fantastic music technologist called Rebecca Fiebrink, um, who works at um, a university in London. It's escaped me the name of that university right now, but a, a great arts computer science program. So Weconator uses, uh, allows music technologists to apply what we call like the classical machine learning algorithms, like... Um, um, K nearest neighbors or um, uh, sort of simple regression algorithms for controlling how mappings would work between a gesture and an output in a musical interface. Uh, and I wanted to do something similar for deep learning to do these 
predictions through time or forward ahead in time. So I'll show you a few examples of how imps works. I think that's on the next slide. And this would be a big headphone warning. The next one is quite loud because it's also one of these big distorted synth sounds. But oops, I don't want to do that. Um, so here's a few examples. Oh, three easy steps. I'll show you the examples of the three steps. muting that for a minute that's a uh, interface called a light pad block uh, made by a company called Rolly. it's sort of a squishy touchpad so you get three dimensions x y and pressure and i recorded a bunch of data and trained my neural network with it and this was the kind of prediction forward predictions through time on that uh, squishy touchpad controller <laughs> That was a interface called a Behringer X Touch. So within Music Tech, if you go to a music store, you might see a bunch of uh, mixers and systems that connect to a computer where you are using knobs and faders or little sliders to control music software. And that's something like that. What I really like about that interface is that it has um, these little lights around the knobs. So the knobs don't have a physical location. They just turn endlessly but the light indicates where you're up to in the range. So the cool thing there was that imps could, um, it, it's an interface where I could control it as a human, but then if I was letting the neural network perform with it, just continue to predict new performance gestures, then I could see where it was up to as well with the little lights and you, the audience can see it as well. So that was a really fun interface to try out. And then this video is a bit quieter. But just to demonstrate, you can also try out imps with a um, sort of standard music instrument, standard musical interfaces like a grand piano, this um, kind of digital grand. Has a, um, I just recorded a bunch of data of one of my colleagues just doing a big blitz, rolling their fingers from low values to high values on the keyboard. And then the system would just predict that over and over in the future. So I've talked a little bit so far about like recording data and, and predicting things, but how does this all connect in, in IMPS? Well, what I, what I did with IMPS, which was basically inspired by the Wekinator, was to make the process of choosing, training, and um, applying a machine learning algorithm in a musical interface very easy. So the IMPS tool provides a system for just collecting data. Once you've set up your interface and music software and you're sending messages to um, imps, you can tell it just to record all that data in a log file and it records all the data uh, for you so that you can then use that as a uh, data set for training a neural network. Then it also has a option just to train the neural network that you want. Um, and it kind of includes good presets um, we often think of deep learning as something where you might need like days slash weeks to train, uh, but that really depends on your goals with the neural network, what your data set is and how big it is. So if you're talking about a data set, which is a giant amount of text from the internet, like all of Wikipedia or something, well, yes, it will take a long time to get through all of that data. But if you've just recorded 15 minutes of interaction with a musical instrument, that's probably like a megabyte of text data in the log file. Um, and we can have perfectly good results with imps uh, training for less than an hour with that kind of data, just on a regular computer, not no big GPUs required. So once you've trained your, your um, RNN, and in fact, for imps, I generally use rather small RNNs. Uh, if people know about um, recurrent neural networks, you know there's this factor called the, the number of units in each layer of the neural network. And uh, I use only 32 units, which is considered to be probably laughably small, but it works. If you've got a small data set, you don't need to learn very much. You can have a, a neural network with a small learning capacity and it will do a job. It may not be a great job, but you can get some interesting results. 
And then the most important thing is that imps lets you perform with this system. So I've got three interaction modes built into imps. And what I mean by an interaction mode is tell imps deciding when it should be making predictions and when it should be listening to the human. And the interaction mode I use most commonly is this call and response one. So I, when I'm playing on the interface, it's receiving messages and it doesn't do anything. All it does is run my gestures through the RNN. So the RNN kind of knows where I'm up to. Its memory state has been updated with the latest information. And then if I stop performing on my interface for some amount of time, maybe two seconds, then the RNN starts to, um, IMP starts to predict from that RNN and starts to perform itself. So it continues the performance from where I left off. Um, then as soon as I touch the interface again, then I start playing. And that's what happened in that first video. First I'm playing. And so on. The two other modes are maybe less obvious that they're useful, but I was wanted to try them out any, anyway. Um, one of them is where both the performer and the RNN just play at the same time. This is like <laughs> just a like going to a free jazz gig where no one's listening to each other. So this is the kind of uh, and maybe antithesis of a useful practice, but at least it illustrates you know some kind of potential. So if you're doing that, I uh, you have to set up your music software so that you can play two different sounds at once. Otherwise, the sounds will kind of be control over the same sound will be running over each other and it won't, won't work with the synth software. Um, the third mode is potentially, it's a little bit more tricky to explain, but every time you adjust any or touch your interface and send one single message to imps, in this mode, it would then make one prediction and then send that right back to your music software. So I call it like filter mode, right? It's trying to predict one step ahead from where you are. Uh, and my idea was that maybe you could get it to perform something which was a little bit different from you, but still in the same style of what you're doing or the same kind of performance. I guess it, when I'm learning from gestural data, musical style means something different. It's more like a gestural style. Like, am I making small adjustments or big adjustments or whereabouts on this touchpad am I swirling? Not things like jazz rock, classical um, Opera, those are sort of high level musical styles which imps wouldn't be able to learn about. Yeah, so that's the the IMPS system, um, which was sort of my, my contribution to the world as attempting to uh, include deep learning within new kinds of musical interfaces. Um, when I perform with it, I use it with uh, a whole stack of kind of homemade synthesis software written in a language called Pure Data, which is a, a great um, open source computer music language based on a visual um, programming metaphor. So it's like you're routing signals through little signal boxes rather than typing lines of code, um, which is a, a fun way to program if once you get used to it. The first time I was coding in PD many years ago and I tried to write a loop uh, or a counter. I think I hit my head against the wall for several hours trying to figure out any way to, to write a counter, but eventually I got it. Um, so yeah, that's imps. Now I'm going to talk about one more, um, one more example, which is a little bit longer because it includes both some hardware development and software development, but it's related to imps. So that's why I've left it till last. Yeah, so this last example is called the Embodied Predictive Musical Instrument, another research project. Um, and this one's a research project I kind of had in my backpack for a few years trying to get it to work. Uh, this is, I call it the MP, which I thought was just a cute, um, a cute acronym for it. And the idea was to get imps, predictions, get synthesis, get sound production with a speaker, all in one handheld instrument. And to get this idea of gestural input and gestural feedback. So you can see in this little video that I've got a box, white box with two little arms. And the little arm on the left is a controller for you to control one knob with this little arm, move it up and down, it makes a sound. The arm on the right is the same kind of arm, but it's controlled by a little motor. 
So that's the output of the neural network responding in some way to what you're doing. So the MP, that's what makes it a embodied interface because it's got a embodied physical output for the neural network to perform with. So what's inside this little box? Well, it's a little Raspberry Pi in there and a kind of Arduino, one of those Arduino Pro Micro, probably a ripped off one from AliExpress or from uh, my local um, electronics shop, connected to a potentiometer for the input lever and a servo, kind of people use for amateur robotics for the output lever and a little speaker and a little amplifier. And it's using the the imp's philosophy of predicting the next movement in time, the next physical gesture that you might make with that input lever and representing it physically. And I suppose my if my flippant summary of this is weird and confusing slash fun, I'm trying to make an instrument which is just something that doesn't exist in the world. It's so out there that no one's ever seen it. And maybe I succeeded. Here's a little bit about how, how it works uh, in practice. In deep inside it, you can see the, the Raspberry Pi. My little, um, you can see my mouse pointer maybe. There's the little Arduino controlling the, connected to the uh, potentiometer and the servo. There's the little amplifier for the sound. And underneath it, I've got like a USB power bank just to power it up. How to build one, the brains, Raspberry Pi 3, I think I mainly use. Um, Arduino Pro Mini, an Adafruit little mono amplifier. Uh, it was great to have um, Limo Freed talking this morning and hearing about Adafruit's work. Um, the speaker I scavenged from a monitor. It's hard, really hard to get a nice small speaker driver, um, but <laughs> I had some, uh, found it like the tech recycling from my workplace. They had some monitors with speakers in them. I could pull them apart. And the custom 3D printed case. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, I, I do have all of this stuff open sourced on, on GitHub. So go and check that out. Software here, it was the same stack as I was using for imps, pure data running in headless mode. The predictions are all running on the Raspberry Pi itself, not doing anything in the cloud, not running on a GPU. On the Raspberry Pi, every prediction was made. And then the interface between the microcontroller and PD is actually MIDI. So you can um, get one of these uh, Arduino MIDI libraries and it just turns the your Arduino into a MIDI interface, which is really handy. And it's just a, a rock solid way of getting a connection to some music computer music software. Now here's the process of creating this thing. I told you I had it in my backpack for a few years. This was my first attempt uh, where my one of my colleagues at work was um, is a robotics engineer and he 3D printed this case for me on their expensive 3D printer. This was just a proof of concept in an open kind of case. And then eventually we decided we could figure it out, just get a uh, Raspberry Pi in this case. So this was the first case that had the Raspberry Pi and the, the Arduino all together. Then I figured out that I could actually squish the speaker inside that case as well. And so far I had no plan. I was just improvising with this, trying to get it to work at all. And this was the, the way I had it for about a year as I was taking it around to conferences, showing people, hey, look at this cool musical instrument I made. And then they would be invariably interested but very confused about what was going on. Um, I decided eventually I didn't like this case because the USB ports were inside it and that made it a bit hard to, to interact with the Raspberry Pi and the network port was inside. So you couldn't remotely control it over a network. It was just a, a bit of a pain. So I had a, uh, a research assistant for a while I could convince to try to spin up some designs for me in Fusion 360. Um, and he did that work for a while and then I took it over. I think the meme in this situation should be, I got started, had a breakdown, bon appetit. Like my pile, the endless pile of 3D printed broken cases on my desk was, um, was potentially impressive, although a bit distressing at the time. And then eventually I got to this design um, where the Raspberry Pi does have its USB and, and Ethernet ports stuck out there. The only problem then is that there's nowhere to put the power port so I had to have a little kind of extension for the power socket on this one so that you could route the power from the back of the Raspberry Pi to a little slot at the front of the case and then 
connect the power bank on the bottom. I'm sure there are there are clever ways to use a, a lipo battery in the case, but um, I couldn't figure it out at that time. And I thought, why don't I just use this USB power bank? I did have another version that had a little screen, and that was a <laughs> this one. I I think I ended up scrapping the screen because I just didn't have anything interesting to put on it. It worked better just without the screen. Just um, you just have to figure out what's going on for yourself and interact with it just like any other musical instrument or a simple musical instrument that doesn't do very much. I'm going to talk a little bit about the training data. So I did two things here. One was the, the typical IMPS approach where I just recorded a bunch of data and trained a, a neural network model. So here's an example of the data. This is at the top of the screen. This is just me moving the little lever up and down through time. It's a three minute performance. And you can see sometimes I sort of step up, sometimes I go back and forth, sometimes I stay in one place, sometimes I move across. And then when I actually train the model, I'll just move to the next slide, you can see the output of the my human data model looks kind of similar. So it did learn to, to create data, which is in some way a similar trajectory through time to what I was doing. It doesn't know anything about the sound I was hearing, it only knows about the movement of that lever. But I wanted to try some other models, so I, I also trained it with some synthetic data or data I just data I just produced with Python programs. Um, I started just trying some different uh, different kinds of waveforms: sine waves, square waves, saw waves. Just moving uh, patterns for moving that um, lever up and down. I trained a model on that, and I ended up with the middle figure you see, which sometimes moves the lever quickly because I was training it with different frequencies of of, uh, of tones or of patterns. Sometimes it moves it slowly and sometimes it does something weird trying to uh, do a, um, a step function. I made one other model just for, for an experiment. I was actually doing an, uh, a computing experiment with this just based on noise. I tried to train it on random noise. The model at the bottom, which was just crazy uh, movements back and forward. Now the last thing I'm going to do today is just show you what these um, what these three systems sound like. So the human model, the synthetic model, and the noise model. So here's another headphone warning. There's three little videos coming up. First, the human model. So you saw in that video, uh, sometimes the system is actually silent if it's not moving the lever. So when I just sort of was tapping the lever forward, it was making a rhythm. And that was my way of creating rhythm with a one-dimensional musical interface. If you move the lever, it makes a sound. And if you stop, it quickly stops the sound. So in that model, it's been trained on data moving back and forth, and you heard at the start it was sort of moving slowly, and then when I tried to move the lever quickly, the model caught on. When it started doing the response, it was quick, so that works too. What about the noise model? Let's see what that does. <laughs> So that was the noise model. It, it basically just takes no notice of what the human does whatsoever and just creates sounds in that same kind of weird random pattern, um, no matter what you do. Now, the reason for making these models and these videos, in fact, was to do a little study with the MP. And I got some musicians and, and um, folks from around the university to try this system out. And I asked them to do little performances with each model with both the lever turned on, the physical movement, and turned off, and just to see what what they would know about the notice about the models. I didn't tell them any information about how they'd been trained, and what I found out was sometimes they liked the human model, sometimes they liked the synthetic model, and sometimes they even liked the noise model. There were people who really 
um, got into that kind of unpredictable motion and spent a lot of time trying to figure out what it was doing. So it's quite surprising to, to find how people actually interact with, with machine learning models. It's not always the case that like the kind of the quality of the model in terms of um, being accurate to a data set is most useful. Sometimes a, a completely weird machine learning model can be very interesting to, to musicians. And I think that's one of the takeaways to, from my talk I want to I want to say is machine learning and music doesn't have to be about huge data sets, huge models, huge compute. You can have a lot of fun, make a lot of music and be really creative with small models, small data and small compute, uh, but with some maybe nodding towards design and understanding of how music is represented with a model. Now I'm at the end of my talk, so I think I'm going to just take some questions if there are any um, from the MC uh, and we can discuss those and if not, I'll just start saying some other stuff. <laughs> we do.